Because it didn't look just like traditional sediment, you know? It might not be manganese coating. Something else might be making it black because we do see some of those dead stalks look like they're black too, right? Yeah, that's true. All right. Yeah, someone in the chat just said we've also seen dead sponge skeletons that are darkly colored. Nice. So, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure you're not a I don't have, biologist? Look, look, look at this. Look, there's no screen. I'm not cheating. There's, I'm not cheating with well, the I think you may have like a chat. secret biology degree up there where you're not telling No, me. I've never taken... Biology past <laughs> high school. <laughs> All right, Jake, you want to come up? Yeah. And I'm going to zoom. I've just seen yeah. thousands of hours of <laughs> this footage ah. with experts telling me what everything is. It's one way to learn. Yeah. We had a viewer asking about what depth we are currently at. Looks like we're at 2,884 meters. Uh, 2467. Oh, okay. Not sure where okay, the wrong going. number. Uh, mm -hmm. it's a bathy we have a lag or something. You know, and just a question for you. Does the arm control give you any force feedback to know if you're against a hard surface? We do not use force feedback on our manip. Um, it is an option, but we disable it. So um, a lot of, well, all that we sample, we have to visually see how it deforms. Um, and that will give us a good indicator of how much pressure we're exerting on it, what the grip force is, et cetera. So it's all visually driven for us. Yeah, for like for large objects like the like rocks, you can tell when like the vehicle moves how much how mm. much force you're applying mm. to it. Just playing a bit of catch up here. This is what it would look like if we went point six knots all the time. <laughs> Rennie, I think it's your ship house that's frozen that Lisa's looking at. What? Me? Your depth on ship house is wrong. I think it got frozen. Where? On this here? Yeah, see it's 2884. Still that's wrong. what I was looking at. Oh, there it is. Now it's updated. Uh, oh, last 15 minutes. We want this. Why isn't this every second? I don't know. Now it just updated. Now it says 2-4. Yeah, but it should be... Should be every second. And Adam, a question: These are all uh, volcanic rocks, correct? Yeah, that's right. All the dark stuff, other than dead sponges, are volcanic rocks, and the light stuff is uh, pelagic sediment. So that's the shells and tests of dead animals that fall down from the, the upper ocean. Okay, yeah, there you go. It's on It's now to be every second. Okay. I don't know how that turned off. I don't use that thing. It's way the over there. The ship house data <laughs> is available through our website, from what I understand. I haven't tried looking at it from our live website, but you can click on more data. Um, you can get a whole bunch more of the um, metadata that we're looking at here in the van. And a viewer is asking about the two green laser dots. Those are to help assess the size of an object object because they are 10 centimeters apart. Why are they green? <laughs> Why not red? They used to be red. Green's more soothing. Yeah, we used to have red ones, but then they dissipate a lot quicker. Yeah. Kind of like a paw print. So water absorbs the uh, red color frequencies in the light. Yeah. And uh, that's why as we uh, as we get closer to the bottom, you'll see that the uh, whites look white and that kind of stuff. But as we pull further away, or if you look at the uh, uh, Argus camera uh, that's uh, up quite a ways, uh, that everything seems to be blue. And uh, that's just because the water naturally filters out the red. Yeah, now our lasers are 532 nanometer lasers. Go ahead and push on in there, please, Dave. Standard, center screen. Standard green color. You guys looking at the worm trail? Is that what you're uh, pointing out? Yeah, I think that's the cucumber poop. Oh, uh, is it? Yep. Not sure if that's worms or if that's... It looks like excrement. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I think it's the All second right. one. Yeah. 
All right, look at that um, brown patch to the just the left of this that we're looking at. Same rock. Brown patch. Yeah. Uh, yep. There, there it, is. it is. Oh yeah, is that a dead dead sponge hold fast? Hold fast. Does kind of look like a hold test. Yeah. All right, I think we're good. All right, full wide, please. We have a viewer asking about uh, finding new species on these exploratory dives. And one of the cool things about this organization is that we collaborate with scientists all over the world, and we have a science chat. And so. We are collecting specimens that scientists are interested in. And so it's a great chance that we have probably collected something that's either new to science or has, is yet unnamed. There's a question on that. I missed it because I was typing notes. Sorry, Lisa. Sorry. I think, I think there was just a statement. It was a statement. Okay. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. Just asking just about talking. asking about how likely it is that we might find new species. Oh. Oh, yeah. quite. That's quite a question. Degree. Yeah, I mean, almost anywhere you go in the deep sea, you have a chance to find new species, and especially so in places that haven't been visited before. And especially at, you know, greater depths where, where there's just fewer observations. From what I understand, it takes many years to conclusively state whether it's new or not, though. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about the levels of the ocean for one of our viewers? The different depths? Yeah, so um, the upper ocean, the shallowest levels are kind of dictated by how much light penetrates. Uh, and let's see, the names of the the mesophotic zones above that the photic zone and the mesophotic zone is where light levels start to get lower then the uh, bathial zone followed by the uh, abyssal and hadal is there a pelagic zone somewhere in there as well yeah somewhere in there yeah and so these are defined by depth ranges and uh, Oftentimes you see organisms that are adapted to live in, in one or some of those zones with the adaptations, you know, targeted towards living in very low light conditions or, or colder water or higher pressures. And some organisms migrate between the zones, especially in the upper ocean where those migrations are often triggered by changing light levels in the ocean. So. Um, light levels are low, some animals will, will come up when they're less likely to be predated and go down when, when light levels are high. Yeah, we generally define the layers based on amount of light, um, the amount of um, the temperature, and then the amount of um, salt, so the salinity. And that ties into the next question, which asks if there are seasonal variations at these in these layers um i think the layers are kind of defined or or stay pretty static in terms of their definitions but i know in different oceans the amount of stratification you know how much difference there is in say the salinity uh is different. So in 
colder polar oceans, there's less stratification than here in the kind of equatorial regions. You can push in there center screen, please, Dave. This is a different coloration. Seems to be more active, too. Oh. That does. It is Maybe hungry. it's just the thruster active activity. Yeah. Oh, there it is. It's very full. <laughs> it is. Doesn't leave much to the imagination, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not relying on Steve for this one. Oh, okay. Hansenotheria. Oh, oh, very nice. I don't know if that's true or not, but very nice. <laughs> yeah, don't uh, don't go to the bank on that. But using the NOAA kind of database with pictures of each of these. And come full wide, there, please, Steve. So flattened out here, which matches our bathy, so generally slightly upslope. And after the end of this move, we will change our course to 140. 140, Reg. That'll take us more towards waypoint 7, and it'll gradually get steeper. Does HIPAC um, kind of calculate slope? Or is that just kind of eyeballing it? Uh, yeah, we have a slope layer in here that we could use, but uh, usually I just I prefer that just the looking at the these are ten meter contours, ten meter depth contours, and yeah. then how tight they are. It just seems so. It's just relative. It's are you just gonna relative, do a snap yeah. zoom there while we? But we have empirical slope data based on the resolution of the bathy that we okay. have. Um, but typically, once we in approach those areas, <coughs> it won't necessarily reflect that just due to like terrain r yeah. rugosity and whatnot. Pretty. That's really nice. Is that what is that a Brisingid? Brisingid. Brisingid? Yeah. It does appear that something below it. A little lobus <laughs> below it. Yep. Wabus. Is that the yeah, you guys or the genus? Pull away, please. Yeah, you guys are lucky that I <laughs> have established the current database because before that it was a lot of that one's pink. <laughs> this one's blobby. <laughs> I think I'm still at that status. <laughs> a viewer would like to know if you think the light scares away some of the species since they live in darkness. Uh you know, now I'm channeling Megan, who had a, a little <laughs> monologue on this earlier, that uh, there's no evidence that it harms them, that it's probably more like when someone shines a flashlight in your eyes and it kind of stuns you. Uh, a lot of these animals, you know, don't have great vision. They might be able to sense light and dark, uh, but uh, they seem to recover after, you know, getting a little startled by by the light but without the light uh, we'd have a lot of trouble working our way around this uh, seamount <laughs> Sarah there's the slope map I just put up but you can see it matches yeah. the contours because they're both derived from the same data set thank you so the, the cooler colors are less slope and the hotter colors are steeper one of our scientists ashore had a nice statement about the holothurian that we just saw that he thinks they're awesome to watch eat they take mm -hmm. just take little fistfuls of sediment in each tentacle and just nom it down oh mm -hmm. that's cool nom it down <laughs>
Looks like maybe these corals are getting a little bigger as we go up the slope. Yeah, a little branchier. If a viewer asking if we ever come across something that shouldn't be here, and I would say marine debris for sure. But in terms of living organisms, one, again, one of the cool things is that we have scientists tuning in from around the world and weighing in on our science chat. And if they see something that might be a new depth record for that organism, they may ask us to collect it for them. There's a nice purple holothurian. Let's see if I can identify that thing. Do it. Oh, boy. There's a little mushroom coral next to it. Oh, yeah. All right, Anth Dave, all you. Anthemastis. Anthemastis. Oh, whatever I said the last one was, this one looks just like that. <laughs> <laughs> bump over. It's kind of mesmerizing to watch the gelatinous layer. Yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Color so beautiful. How do holothurians reproduce? Uh, I'm going to have to ask Google on that one. That's okay. Oh, I thought that there's no punchline to that. <laughs> 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 Very carefully. <laughs> Slowly. Oh, oh yeah. Sinolactidae. <laughs> Sin Sin to die. That's a... Uh, could be pale up tidies. It's like really a interesting sponge piece. It's a bit sexual yeah. and asexual reproduction. Dave, you can do a partial as we go by this guy. Thank you. Yeah, what is that? Oh, maybe it looks like wood. It's a hollow sponge. I don't remember seeing a sponge that looks anything like that. Yeah. Could be wood. And then he's on wood, has that little knobular bit there. Knobbly, yeah. 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 Hmm. All right, full line there, please, Dave. There was a... Kind of look like dried out cactuses, desert. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have a question for the front row. How are you navigating the ocean floor? Do you use data from the top side of the ship, or you have onboard radar, or what? I'll take that one. Yeah, oh, go no, ahead. go ahead, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Adam can do it. Um, yeah, so we have... Let me just call in on a ship move, too, so we keep moving. Uh, one second. Uh, 
so we the ship has GPS that you may be familiar with. So satellite time of flight using multiple to triangulate your position. Um, but GPS doesn't work underwater, so we have to pair that with something that helps us locate uh, where the vehicles are. So we use acoustics. Sound travels well through water, so um, we have a USBL acoustic positioning. It stands for ultra short baseline. Uh, the baseline being how close together the transducers are that uh, triangulate positioning. So we have a unit that has a few transducers in it that um, can, or it's essentially listening, um, listening to sound that's emitted. And we are able to, because we have tethered vehicles, we send an electrical trigger pulse down to both vehicles that tell um, transponder beacons, which are basically talkers uh, on either vehicle to send an acoustic pulse at a certain time. So we're constantly telling them, send a pulse, send a pulse, send a pulse. And depending on our depth, it's every couple seconds, plus or minus. So those acoustic pulses travel through the water column based on the uh, speed of sound through water in a given body of water and depth, et cetera. And our transducer array, our, our listener, hears that and it can triangulate uh, the range and the bearing. So kind of where it was. Uh, based on the phase difference of the wavelength that it's receiving. So then we take those ship relative positions and we pair them with the ship's MRU, Motion Reference Unit. Um, so we know where the ship was in space, how it was oriented, if it was rolled one way or pitched one way. We can kind of figure out exactly where the vehicles are in relation to the ship, and then we can take those relative positions and translate them to global by pairing them with the GPS, so that way we have latitude and longitude uh, positions for the vehicles. And um, we also have another means of acoustic navigation. So um, we have an acoustic Doppler current profiler, an ADCP that's downward facing on the back of Hercules. So it's facing the seafloor. Uh, so it's sending out acoustic pulses and based on the Doppler shift of the frequency received can sense velocity. So now we have a highly, it's a locally accurate system, doesn't know where it's in it, it is in space, um, but it's very locally accurate. We can draw a very nice line of points. Um, we then pair that to our USBL positioning. So you may hear occasionally we're talking about a DVL reset is that's a, D a Doppler is dead reckoning, so it's just basically telling something to move. I want you to move two meters bearing west or something like that. But over time, you may have only stepped 1.9 meters, and maybe you were slightly uh, north of west. Over time, that position deteriorates, and uh, we need to constantly uh, refix that to our best guess of where it is based on the USBL positioning. So the ADCP does um, velocity of Hercules? Yes. It's on the back of, it's mounted on the back of Hercules. And then there's a compass in Hercules as well, yeah? Mm -hmm. There's a gyro compass and there's backup magnetic compasses. Argus has two magnetic compasses. It does not have a gyro. And the ultra sharp baseline between the transducers is between transducers on the ship and the vehicle? Just on the ship itself, so the head oh. has, I think, four, like four transducer heads on it. Okay. Yeah, another way people navigate is by a, by long baseline. So there, you put out the listening devices on the seafloor and you know far apart from each other, and then you ping both of them. But the USBL is a great advance because it makes the whole package a lot smaller. Doesn't require you to put out those beacons and survey them in, and okay. makes it a lot easier. Yeah, I think that's the best way to understand USBL is L understanding LBL. And it's just like taking those l at long baseline and bringing those transducers together and triangulating from the wavelength phase shift rather than just listening and time delays. And what might be cool in the future is like whole ocean long baseline 
um, but there's some real challenges. One is to know the to have the same clock at the mm -hmm. you know transmit and receive, and then also to know the um, how the velocity of the water changes over really long distances. That's right. Yeah, that that's something that we. Ooh, look at that thing. And push on in there, please, Dave. Deal with regularly when we're dealing with multi-beam sonar is constant changes of sound velocity, especially near the surface. Renee, I feel like you need to give that speech again with a PowerPoint for me to fully understand. Uh, what's yeah, that? That was, great, uh, that was a great explanation of it. Oh, yeah, sure. I have a PowerPoint somewhere. Okay. I don't know that I've ever seen so that fish before. Um... The name has been said many times it that I've heard and I don't I can't remember it at all. One of our scientists ashore suggested Rennie bringing the USBL screen up. Sure. For, um, for everyone to see. Let's see, there's USBL nav. That one's probably it's a little bit messy right now, but <laughs> But it looks very slick. Yeah, it looks cool. <laughs> yeah, the I don't coolest looking one that we have, but we don't typically need it too much because we pipe that to other navigation screens. Which one is it? Uh, it should just be USBL nav or Sonardyne, actually. Yeah, Sonardyne. I have. Sonardyne. I have, yeah, well, they're called PC one, two, three, four in my. Oh, I don't know if it's yeah. piped into that. You might have PC. I got high pack. You have high pack. You might have um, Rav nav, which is the one that's right next to Jake. Yeah, that's that's which Rav nav. Rav nav. Yeah, that's good enough. So it's, of course, a bad time to show because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's like acting pretty. You can see that there's, in general, these uh, I don't think pings. It's live yet. Oh, he's yeah. putting it Hold over. on just a second. Okay, that's wow. going out over the satellite now. All right, so on channel three, lower left of the quad, you can see um, one of the positioning softwares that we use. Um, so we have the ship over here. And then we have currently a dizzying array of pings. <laughs> the dark blue is Argus, and the t light, the teal is Hercules. Those are the USBL hits. Um, they're a little bit erratic right now, although you can sense the linear pattern and direction that they're generally going in. Obviously, the vehicles are not bouncing all over the seafloor. It's just the positioning we have. Uh, one of the reasons being the weather that we have and the, how hard the thrusters are working, and uh, we tend to a uh, tends to send a bit of water or sound in the water column which affects our positioning accuracy but that's generally um the track that we're going in and then we have a, a, a green line here that's that doppler the dvl doppler velocity log that we're using for the more local positioning the dead reckoning great thank you that was a great Uh, there's a question on chat for you, Rennie. So with the ADCP, is that figuring out the relative motion of Herc across the ground, or is it measuring the movement in the water? It's, acro the it's across the ground, so it's bouncing off of the... Um, it's, it's really close to the surface, obviously, because Hercules is close to the surface. So it's bouncing off of the um, substrate. And with that, could you profile the currents of the water under Herc if there were some currents moving along? Um, I don't know if you could tune it that way, perhaps. I, so one of the reasons that we use it is we can, can actually oh, hold yeah. position uh, with the vehicle. So if you know the velocity, you can stop. You can have the, the computer that programs the thrusters uh, stop the vehicle from moving. So we do see that drift over time sometimes. That could be current related. Um, but the position's drifting, not the actual, the reported position, not the actual position. Yeah, they, I've only heard ADCP in terms of measuring current. So it's yeah. interesting to use that as a... Yeah, I mean, that's what it's used yeah. for is upward facing and measuring current. But okay. I think because it's so close to the floor, it's kind of bouncing so off of that. downward facing, it changes the game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and sometimes on vehicles, they're... They're called DVLs or Doppler velocimetry loggers. Yeah. But I think you're right that the frequency 
is different for purposes of positioning a vehicle versus looking at uh, moving water masses. So really cool feeding trail patterns in sediment. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen those yet. It's like a little maze. Yeah. Yeah. Must be a really full holotherian around here somewhere. Or like a little <laughs> family. Family of holotherians. Yeah. That were reproduced asexually. I believe that's what you said, right? Uh, they can do both, sexually or yeah. asexually. Huh. I don't know if that's... It must be species dependent, but I don't know. I'd imagine that they might need that because of just the sparsity, the scarcity of others. A viewer is asking, what are, what's the most unexpected thing you have found underwater? Uh, the flip flop was pretty unexpected. Yeah, that was. <laughs> just one. Where's the other one? <laughs> Yeah, for me it was a, a toilet. <laughs> Although another cool th uh, unexpected thing was uh, saw something like really white off in the distance and went to look and it was a, a book and it was, you could still like turn the pages of wow. it. Wow. Oh. So we, <laughs> we turned to the cover and it was um, like Port security regulations. <laughs> and, and someone had just thrown it over the side of the ship. Something no one wanted to read anyway. <laughs> Another nodule field here. Yeah. There's like so much more sediment on this yeah. you know, traverse than we saw yesterday. This is a, f a, a flat flatter patch though. Yeah. Looks like they also they Grabbed a couple more push cores previously. Oh no, those were the ones we did. Oh, so we have three push cores left. We do. Okay. Earlier today, our expedition lead was talking about finding a rice cooker, and when they opened it up, it had an octopus living inside. Mm -hmm. Kind of unexpected. That's pretty cool. <laughs> were any of you on dives at the octopus garden? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean Last that's. Year pretty unexpected. That, that was unexpected. Yeah, that was cool. really cool. Just not knowing that that was going to be there. Or the whale fall. Oh and the whale fall. Oh, I want to see that. We saw that in the sonar, actually, in Argus's sonar. It was like, let's let's go poke at that. Let's go interrogate that and then change the course of the whole dive. Yeah. And the course of history, <laughs> some might say. Yeah. Not many people. <laughs> yeah, who would say that? Well, <laughs> I just said it. That's about it. Just in like right next to this nodule field, there was sediment with no nodules. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that has to mean there's like active accumulation of sediment. Mm. Or does that mean that there's a relative or rise over there? So they're rolling down to settle in this little basin? Yeah, are they in I think situ they here? Form I they they, they form in situ. place, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. you, how else could you get them so evenly spaced across the surface? Mm. It reminds yeah. me so much of de desert pavement, mm -hmm. the whole process under here. Yeah, there's some of that in Rhode Island, I believe. Is that right? uh, it's, uh, <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> just a tiny, tiny All bit. All the deserts in Rhode Island. Yeah, <laughs> we were talking about that earlier today. No, that's <laughs> Known for its coastlines and deserts. <laughs> Speaking of like crazy juxtapositions of terrains, on the big island of Hawaii, I heard they had a blizzard on top of Mauna Kea. Yeah. So There's probably someone who skied and surfed in the same day. <laughs> yeah. That's when we were coming into port. There's some more of that like uh, linear stuff, maybe. Yeah, well, that, maybe that does look like a dead sponge stalk there. Yeah, to the lower left, yeah. Interesting. We have a technical question. This is, uh, what are the operating systems used on board? Mm. Uh, one second. Mm. 
Those are well no well. Front row is discussing um, positioning stuff. Um, Lisa, you want to repeat your question? Oh, yeah. The uh, one of our viewers wanted to know what operating systems we use on board. Oh. You name it. We got um, it. Operating systems for the vehicle? Like computer, computer uh, operating systems? They were looking at the navigator screen. And when oh, they okay. Used. Hey, Renny? Yes. Uh, can you talk about operating systems for navigation? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. We're just um, the we have some Windows machines. Um, we have a Linux machine that we use. Actually, several Linux machines. Oh, just look, yeah. Looking down the row here, Windows, Linux, Linux, Linux. This is its own. The dynamic positioning system is its own thing. Actually, I think it's on. A, it's Windows based. It's a Windows program. Um, we have some Mac computers, but not typical, not anything for critical. We use Macs, we use Macs on the production side, on the production uh, side. in the studio for interactions. Um, and then we have some embedded systems that are, uh, written specifically for, uh, certain functions. Uh, a lot of Windows machines, uh, on the uh, production and recording side as well. Yep, all good. Some of the nodules. Yeah, we can look for small ones and slurp them. Yeah, sure. Cool. The big boss back here is interested <laughs> in collecting some of those. Yeah, Raj. Um, sure. You wanna we got a bit of a swing in us, so we can I try can, to do it on the fly. I think we'll probably have flat for a bit, so I can. Why don't you get ahead as far as you can? Yeah. I'll stop the ship. Roger that. Bridge nav. Yeah, right. Hold position. Adam will get to slurp up here, yeah? Great. We'll just, uh, yeah, if you. Pop get ahead as much as you can. I think I think we'll have enough in the bank. Yeah, looks like it continues up here pretty well. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Adam, how about over here to the left of screen? <laughs> That's great. Okay. All right, Jake, you want to get there, mount? Sure. I missed that. Is this a slurp? That we're this is a slurp. Yeah, correct. Okay. Well, for make sure we just get the small ones. Yeah. Small ones. Yep. What's uh? What's our the slurp best. Um, jar situation? Which, which ones we are three? Three, four, five, and six open. Three, four, five, six. I think then we filled our watch has filled the slurps. Then I don't think our watch is the sample in. We're sampling fiends, guys. Yeah, we are. Yeah. If Maybe we don't find name. Some, something uh, biological, we'll get a piece of wood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, biology, sure. Kind of on a kind of a bad perch here, Jake. So. Good. You're all clear. You want bubble? Or are you good? Oh, I'm okay. Okay. I'm gonna slurp while you're doing that, or uh, flush. Okay. All right, flushed. And sorry, Sarah. Can you repeat? We have a uh, three and four open. Yeah, three, four. Um, also five and six. Oh, you're okay. Pink. Let's do number six. All right, Jake. All right. 
Go for some smaller beams. Oh, no, uh, Go ahead and push zoom in a there. bit there. Yeah. That's great. All right. Maybe just like scoop along <laughs> the surface. Yeah. <laughs> You're at full 100% there. Good. And I'll have you milk it as well once you're done. Try to find smaller ones. Nice. Yeah. Which jar is that? I can't read the Six. number. Six. Six. Thank you. What sample number is this? This is zero four zero. Zero four zero. Oh, I'm not seeing That's any going there yet. Maybe we'll drop that one. Yeah. yeah. I'm dropping it now. Zeroed. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, going back on. I'm not seeing any going yet, so. Some extensive milk. I saw some in the tube. Yeah. Five or six rolled into the tube. Let's see if they come through. Might be a little too heavy. Yeah. Yeah, bubble. bubble certainly be in the suction hose. Yeah, we yeah. can bubble zoom on the hose, maybe. But hopefully it doesn't block anything else coming in. We still, oh yeah, there they are. There they are, you yeah. can see it in bubble there. Keep okay. on doing that, Jake, you're almost yep. there. Yeah, I'm up there. <laughs> kind of almost yeah, there. you are. <laughs> it's the out that brings them up. <laughs> Okay, well, how about you stack like <laughs> two more small ones in there and then right. they're already in there anyway. Yeah. There we go. For, yeah. Then we'll get out ahead and um, we can we can do some more hose hosing. Over here. Just try to get them up there. It looks like all intact, maybe up yeah. to the right or in center screen. Center screen? Yeah, that little one. That's the big one that you almost. This yeah. one? Yeah. Okay. There you go. That's nice. a couple more. All right. I All think right. that's perfect. All right. We're going to come full wide there, please, Dave. And then you keep on doing the whole milk and game for a while, and I'll get out ahead. And then maybe if it's not coming out, you can pull it out and then do a shake that <laughs> seems like yeah that's on the out it brings it up yeah yeah what's it have to go through past that uh there's just one junction one and then it yeah but that that should be all right i'll let you do that Oh, there's one came through. Nice. Mm -hmm. Keep going. I think you got about seven more to go. <laughs> <laughs> Another one. Nice. Keep going there, Jake. Yeah, there's quite a few in that house. Bring it around town. Oh, there you go. Nice. A bunch. You're doing great. They're coming, slow but steady. Did we see some more in your hose there. You got a yeah, bit more left to go. Those yeah. are hard to get get up to the top of the tube, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, those ones don't want to go. Oh, it's almost there. You're almost there. Oh, 
<laughs> yeah, so it looks like those small nodules did get stuck in the uh the hose there, but uh, got several of them actually. Many, many uh, made it up through. Oh, they made it all the way through. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can see some yeah, in there. Yeah, okay. Just a couple spare ones. Do we know how many are still in the hose? Uh, at least two. Okay. But we don't know if the heavy ones are stuck at the bottom. Okay. Thank you. Adam, um, one of our viewers would like to know why they form as nodules instead of sheets. Before you answer that, uh, do you want to keep continuing here? I'll just call in. Yeah, let's uh, make another move. Sure. Yeah, the uh, they they start forming around some sort of nucleus, some some hard surface that the the minerals start to precipitate on, and eventually they will merge together into a sheet. But uh, to begin with, they form on these hard bits, and they're spread across the surface, and uh, and that's why we see them as these separate um, bits. Uh, you know, on some manganese nodules, when you cut them open, you find the nucleating is a whale ear bone. Evidently, it's the hardest bone of a whale and it's last to dissolve. Hmm. And cool. it can act as a nucleating center around which it then grows. So it's always fun to take nodules and cut them in half and look at what What's was the there? nucleating agent that got them going. You can cut them open, Bob? Yeah, you slice them in half, and you'll see what who started the ball game. You're gonna do that here, though. Yeah, we've got a well, saw. Well, yeah, we got a saw. We got Back. a bunch of really small ones, and we can easily you know, have ten cut them open and see what yeah. what started the game. On the last cruise, Bob, we uh, we saw something similar as the rostrum of a beaked whale, which apparently does not. It's similar to the inner ear. It doesn't uh, go away as well over time. So huh. it was there, and it was coated in manganese. Although much more of the shape of the bone rather than a nodule. There's a question about um, what's the largest pitch um, and roll angle that you can get on Hercules? This was in reference to getting those last nodules through. Yeah. Do a tail stand? Or <laughs> yeah. Jake's coming online for that. Okay. Is he? Or not. Did you catch that, Jake? <laughs> what? What? what was that? Pitch and roll of Hercules. What's, What's the, the largest we could get? I actually have it, a readout of it up here. Um, it's, lar I mean, it's largely bound by the syntactic foam at the top. Okay. Um, so it's like can't we don't we can't really barrel roll the thing, although yes. that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> it's very stable in the horizontal plane. Yeah. 
But I can tell you right now, as we read these out, it's, uh, our roll is varying between 0 and 0.5 degrees just sitting here. And measured to horizontal. Measured to horizontal, and our pitch is a constant negative uh, 2 degrees right now. Okay. With a little bit of variation, but... Thank you. I think if... Is so negative our, pitched forward or back? Uh, I'm not sure on the... Uh, the uh, how the orientation of this? It's probably gonna mm, probably back, right? You think? Probably be pitched back. The motor's yeah. a bit heavier. Um, yeah, so I'd assume pitch back. I'm not sure with what where it's relative to. Mm -hmm. But if I were a guessing person, which I am, <laughs> I would assume back. We have more weights in the back as well. Yeah, I think we have a lot of those singular weights attached to the back. Singular okay. lead weights. We also don't have a um like the computers are computer isn't telling it to be unstable. So I think if we were to add a bit of code in there that said, try to turn, you know, try to really roll, and we thrust down with one and up with the other, mm -hmm. something like that, then maybe you could get a little bit more, but we don't typically want that. As it's not desired. <laughs> yeah. There's no barrel desired. roll functionality. Yeah. Makes our bad visuals. <laughs> Adam, can you explain what you will do with the samples? The oh, ones okay. we just collected? Yeah, for example. Yeah, so we will um, take a look at them physically, you know, examine them in our hands, and we'll cut them open and see what the inside looks like, and then we can uh, look at the chemistry of the, the nodule, in particular, in particular the rare metals, uh, looking at how concentrated they are. It's a lot easier to vacuum those up than to take on hard bedrock. Yeah, it's like a... a Placer deposit. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> mini version of some of the, the big nodule fields in the uh, you know, southeast of Hawaii, the Clarion Clipperton zone. I was just struck by the uh, extensiveness of that field we went Frost. Yeah, and it seemed to be in a saddle area. I mean, it looked pretty, pretty flat. Flatter area, yeah. It's right, right before you came in. There was a bunch of sediment next to it with n no nodules at all. Yeah, yeah, so. I saw that. That could be just mass wasting down the hill. So it could be what mass mass wasting. The, you know, just the oh burying the nodules. Just that were flowing there. down the hill. You know, that's what a lot of this. You'll see the shooting. I mean, it lands and then it goes downhill and develops its own drainage, be interesting. drainage pattern. We got the we got some push cores earlier, and, and we know there are nodules on top. But it'll be interesting to see if there's also nodules yeah, yeah, at various yeah. depths within it. But the sediment's got to go somewhere, and it goes down and then develops its own uh, distributary system. So when you see a lot of just sediments, that's what you're looking at. The, the drainage pattern off the top of the hill. What would cause gravity? Ra mass wasting. Beg your pardon? Like now, recently. Uh, yeah. So it could be earthquakes. It could be just kind of continued alteration um, of the mass wasting of the rock of the sediment. It could just be over steepening, and and then even uh, you know changes from weather or something like that that uh, destabilize it if it's right at the kind it's of failure like point. Like trying to like glue itself together. Yeah. And almost like That's sort of interesting. That one's sort of more black than everyone else. Yeah, sometimes we've seen um, these feeding trails yeah, yeah. that have cleaned, you know, really cleaned off some of these. Polish them almost. Mm -hmm. Just starting to see a little bit of that movement in, uh, in Argus.
So does this remind you at all of what you were seeing on the famous expedition with these you know, well, big pillow ridges? You know, basically, yeah, the tomb lay eyes. Basically, you know, it's just been painted over. I mm -hmm. mean, naturally, in the Project Famous area, the flows were less than 10,000 years old. So right. You had a lot of pelagonite and budding, and it, you almost needed sunglasses. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, re the reflective nature of the glass, and this is, and it's like someone poured a pile of tar on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so it's all smooth and used to have lots of cracked open pillows and yoke like a yoke coming out and mm -hmm. uh, uh you know much more uh, detail in the in the bread crust expansion of the pillow and you get the popping bread crust uh, texture to it right but this is like i say it looks like someone threw a blanket over mm -hmm. uh, over the dinner table has anyone ever recorded an underwater flow like that to hear the acoustics of the cracking? Well, they've done it with scuba diving off Hawaii. Let's go in and watch it. And the problem they had with the divers is sometimes when they the, the pillows actually implode, it's almost like a hand grenade going off and it oh, ruptures okay. your ears. Oh, wow. hmm. oh, my gosh. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people, you know, when it flows in on Kilauea and flows down the slope and into the ocean, people have gone in and and and, Watch it. and watched it. It's a pretty it. pretty. I mean, this kind of lava is is dry. It's right. from deep in the earth, so it's you can get you know even on land you can get really close to yeah. it. Yeah. But in subduction volcanoes, they're highly volatile. Lots of water was taken down in the subducting plate, and those are those are the bad guys. Yeah, explosive. But yeah, you can get real close to these guys. Yeah, in, I will one day. <laughs> <laughs> At the East Pacific Rise, they had some ocean bottom seismometers out when an eruption occurred, okay. and in fact, many of them were trapped uh, in the lava, and they recorded a bunch of implosions uh, that seemed to track where the lava was going. The same thing happened actually up at at uh, Axial Volcano on the Wanda Fuca Ridge. So they do make some noise. Yeah. And if you can figure out where the noise is coming from, you can kind of track the progression of the lava across oh, the seafloor. That's really cool. But you can actually bring up some really fresh lava and it'll pop on the deck like okay. popcorn hmm. once you take the pressure off of it. And in some cases off Sicily and even at the... Uh, uh, Steve Carey found it down south of Baja where you the, the rocks float. Oh yeah, Megan. Yeah, the, the lava balloons. Yeah. yeah, they have so much vesicles, so much gas in them that they literally flow. It's like pumice. It washes up on the beach. <laughs> they make great uh, scrub brushes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. My favorite story was, you know, in Hame when it erupted in downtown Hame, and they evacuated everyone, and they went and found every fire hose they could get, and they literally uh, drove the uh, lava flow, made it turn, go down Third Avenue, make a right hand turn. Is that and what the they, movie was based on? They that? even <laughs> even brought it out and made a new harbor, a breakwater. Wow. I mean, the huh. uh, the Icelandic people have been living. They call it the Midgarp Serpent. Wow. Oh. They've been living on top of this serpent 